Akimov pressed the AZ-5 button. The AZ-5 took an outrageous 18 to 21 seconds for the procedure to be completed. Maybe he knew how slow it worked? Probably he didn't. But that button was the last defense against something that couldn't be stopped otherwise now. And that button has failed. Hello guys. I was happy to hear that you liked the previous RBMK design and history episodes so much. After feeding you this technical talk and giving you the necessary background for it, this time we will speak about the Chernobyl event itself. A lot of you may wonder why it exploded, what the circumstances were, was there anything more to be done, could it be avoided? The simple answer for the last two of these questions is probably not. The Chernobyl event was not a single moment action, but rather a series of wrong decisions that led to the disaster we know today. Each of the particular actions taken by the operators was making the reactor closer to the edge, in which the AZ-5 button was just the catalyst. We have introduced you to Pripyat history and RBMK design. If you haven't watched it yet, it would better if you do it now. The 16 episodes before that one have been aimed to introduce you to the background of the Chernobyl disaster. Each of them is important as each decision made by the operators and each outcome raises another question. All these questions could be answered by both knowledge about the political atmosphere of the USSR at the time, and the technical issues of the RBMK design, or even the shortages during power plant building. You can find the links to two playlists, in this video description where you will find a lot of information on these subjects. And that's really important for you to understand what was actually the reason behind the Chernobyl disaster. RBMK Design and History Part 9 5 Steps Towards the Disaster After Leningrad's RBMK accident, there were two reports written. The official was, of course, pointing out some minor issues that were not related to the design or shortages in materials. The unofficial recognized several problems with the RBMK design and even major defects during the construction of the power plant buildings. Despite that, not a single change was made in both the reactor itself and the buildings. As I mentioned several times before, the quality of Soviet craftsmanship was so poor that there was an additional overhaul phase included in every project or construction, to check for faults and remove them or at least find them, as there were often no means to repair them. One of the most important findings of the Leningrad Accidents Committee was a flow in the valves and flow meters in all our BMK reactors. They were used to regulate the supply of a crucial coolant, water. Each of the 1600 uranium-filled fuel channels was getting hot and the coolant was needed to regulate the temperature to be sure there wasn't a chance for meltdown. But the meters were of so poor quality that the operators, located in the control room of a particular BMK reactor, had practically no idea how much of the coolant reached the reactor, meaning how well it cooled down. They couldn't even tell if they were being cooled at all. Despite the findings being extremely important, not a single change was made as the Soviet Union Council of Ministers gave the RBMK design their final approval. After the first RBMK in Leningrad, there came the time for the next pair of RBMK-1000 reactors, in Chernobyl, which was expected to produce an output of an impressive 4000 megawatts. Now, let's fast forward to the time the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was built, 
and the four reactors installed, while the next two were under construction. You probably know that the reactor number 4, which finally exploded, was being tested on that final night. But on the other hand, it was already working and supplied the USSR's grid with its huge power. How could it be? In the normal circumstances, the reactor should be tested first. After all, that was the point of all these tests, right? To make sure everything works as it should and the reactor is completely safe. But that was not the case in the Soviet Union. The need for electricity was so big, the reactors started to produce it for the regular grid almost immediately after the installation phase. And the tests were taken in the meantime. That was practically the first step towards the Chernobyl disaster. Another one was the operators themselves, partially at least. First of all, during this series I have explained how the reactor operators had to do a lot of calculations themselves as they couldn't rely on the measurements given by the installed machinery. Second of all, because of that, operating the RBMK required a lot of experience, as there was no actual manual, at least not one that explained how to do it properly. The official instructions couldn't mention something like we designed the RBMK so big, no one can tell how high is the level of reactivity in its particular part at a given time. It would mean that designers would acknowledge their faults. Maybe you can recall the scene from HBO's Chernobyl, when the two operators, Akimov and Toptunov, see the instructions left by the previous team that worked on the shift before theirs. That's exactly what it would have felt like to operate the RBMK. No one knew exactly how it behaved at the moment. That was the third step towards a disaster. The fourth one was the pressure to complete the test. The USSR had a strict list of goals that had to be achieved. A lot of them, including technological or economical, were just reported done while they actually were not. That's how it worked and why the Soviet Union had so big problems. The operators should have postponed the test, but they couldn't. Not that they wanted to, we don't know this for sure, but even if they did, they probably wouldn't be allowed to. The fifth step was all the decisions that were made. Not only because some of them were wrong, but also because they couldn't know if they were wrong or not. Partially because of the faulty indications that the RBMK's computer has shown. We could put it this way. They could either listen to the machines and computers, do it by the book, or they could just trust in their gut and do the calculations themselves. The saddest part is that probably neither of these two options would have saved them from the events that had happened later that night. Having in mind the political, economic, technical and human background of it, probably nothing could save the world and countless individuals from the Chernobyl disaster. The moment they have decided to run that test was a final nail to the coffin, and the disaster would probably happen either way. Maybe not on such a scale, but nonetheless, it would. Thanks for watching. The next episode will be the last one for now in the RBMK Design and History miniseries. I think 10 videos straight on the same subject could be enough. We will continue, of course, but we have several other interesting stories to tell you about Chernobyl. If you liked that video, please let me know. I would appreciate any insights from you. Also, if you want to propose any subject related to nuclear energy, Chernobyl, Pripyat, or similar, feel free to do so. I'm always happy to hear what you think or need. 
that's it for today guys. Take care, stay safe, and see you next week.